So what does it mean to comprehensively define a problem? We are going to break this lesson into two parts. The first part is going to be very interactive for lack of a better word. So what you might wanna do right now, pause this video and go grab a blank sheet of paper and a pencil. Because what we're gonna do is we're going to map out our problem and its contributing factors and its impacts. So before we get into that, just a little bit of background. So uh, problem definition uh, is the first step of policy analysis. Uh, and we've got some, some things to keep in mind as we do this. Uh, we want to be very clear about what the problem is, be very clear and specific. Sometimes uh, we define problems a little bit too broadly and a little bit too generally to be useful. Um, we do want to be very clear and very careful to define our terms um, because some of the words that we use in our regular day-to-day -day lives have multiple meanings and could mean different things to different people. While we frame our work in a kind of value-driven kind of starting point, we do have to be very careful to also define good and bad because those things could be different for different people. Remember, we're, we're staking a claim about the way that we think the world should be um, and we have to be very clear about that. Um, and when we define problems, we should avoid framing problems as a lack of something, because that automatically implies that the state that the solution is to provide more of that thing. Um, so we want to We also want to try to identify why this problem exists. Why is it happening? And we have a few things to keep in mind as we, we go through this process. Um, if you've taken any kind of stats or research methods course, you will have heard over and over, correlation does not mean causality. Uh, sometimes it is associated with causality, but correlation does not automatically mean causality. And the overused example is that uh, there is a direct correlation between uh, ice cream sales and drowning. Does ice cream cause drownings? Of course it doesn't, but both things tend to increase at the same time during the summer. Uh, therefore, those two things correlate, but one does not cause the other. Uh, we're also going to look at where our problems come from, and we're going to think of this in terms of immediate contributing factors and root contributing factors. Um, this becomes very important in a moment. Immediate contributing factors are the things that we can see directly leading to our problem. Uh, these are the, the kind of right there in your face contributing factors to whatever this problem is. Um, whereas root contributors are a few steps away. Root contributors are the things that lead to the things that lead to our problem. Um, and um, it will very often be the case that our problem has several immediate contributors, um, but has even more root contributors that may contribute to several of those immediate contributors. This sounds really confusing, but it's going to make a little bit more sense once we start mapping out our problem. So with that piece of paper that I asked you to grab, what we're going to do is we're going to make a problem map. And this is a way for us to kind of visually brainstorm uh, the problem and its contributing factors and its impacts or its outcomes. And again, while we're being very careful about the word cause, we are going to kind of use it casually here because um, we're going to situate our problem in the context of its causes and its effects, right, its impacts. So to start, just kind of write your, your general problem in the center of the paper. Once you've done that, uh, on the left side of your paper, uh, you'll kind of give the heading of contributing factors. And you'll start by identifying the immediate contributing factors to climate change. In this case, we know carbon emissions are the leading cause of climate change. Uh, they are the leading direct cause of climate change. Um, and so this is as far as I am right now. So I should have my problem in the center of the paper and the immediate contributing factor directly to the left. Um, and I have a little arrow pointing to the relationship, right? So um, arrows indicate kind of the flow of the flow of impact. So carbon emissions lead to climate change. So now we're going to identify the root contributing factors, right? The, the things that contribute to that, that immediate contributing factor, right? So what contributes to carbon emissions? 
Uh, well, we have our reliance on fossil fuels. Uh, we have our personal uh, consumption habits. Uh, industry, agriculture, and shipping are uh, among some of the kind of leading contributors to carbon emissions. Um, and then, of course, our own personal transport decisions, right? The cars that we drive around in uh, uh, belch carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and so all of these things are root contributing factors to carbon emissions. Um, and you can, you'll notice that while all of my arrows point to uh, carbon emissions, some of our root contributing factors may lead to other root contributing factors. So, so our consumption habits tend to drive uh, the processes and, and the, the activities of industry and agriculture and shipping. Um, if we really like uh, avocados, um, an avocado is a very resource uh, heavy uh, item and has to be shipped thousands of miles to Wilmington, Delaware. And so you can see links between some of these contributing factors. So now we wanna think about impacts. What are the impacts of climate change? And I've got three immediate impacts here. There are probably many more, but I'm just gonna focus on these three for now. Uh, so on the right side of the page, you'll write the heading impacts. Um, and we'll just focus on the directly observable impacts uh, of climate change. So for our example, we're talking about polluted air, we're talking about sea level rise, and we're talking about unpredictable weather patterns. So take a moment and do that. So now, just like we uh, identified the root contributing factors to climate change, we're going to identify kind of secondary impacts of climate change. What are the things that result from those, those immediate impacts of climate change? Um, so polluted air, right, leads to health impacts, uh, asthma, um, and, and things like that. Uh, sea level rise can lead to displacement uh, as people are, are, are pushed from their homes by flooding. Um, sea level rise can also threaten food and water availability. Um, unpredictable weather also can threaten food and water availability. Uh, in the American West, there are serious droughts that make it very difficult to, uh, to grow uh, the crops that many of us rely on to eat. And some of these secondary impacts can also lead to other secondary impacts. As food and water become scarce, uh, we can imagine that people will move to places where food and water are more plentiful. Um, we can imagine that uh, there will be health impacts as the availability of, of healthy foods as, as vegetables and, and fruits uh, are, are less available because there are fewer of them because the uh, agriculture has been impacted by, by uh, unpredictable weather. And as food and water uh, become scarce, we can project that there will be conflict over their availability. Um, and this has been kind of quipped by uh, social commentators uh, already that uh, some of the future wars that humanity will have will be over the availability of water. As people are displaced by sea level rise and the lack of resources, there will probably be some conflict when they end up in their new locations. Uh, there might be some friction as they settle in. So at this point, your, your paper should look like a web here where you've got uh, your contributing factors on the left side, your impacts on the right side, and uh, arrows kind of indicating all sorts of uh, relationships between these things. And I'm just going to ask you to hang on to this for a moment. So now we're going to move into comprehensive problem definition. Uh, this is the kind of more formal written portion of policy analysis. We did the brainstorming, and now we're going to really kind of build on this and, and, and really elaborate. So this is where you're going to make your kind of formal policy problem statement, and you're going to describe the nature of the problem. You're going to need some data to do this properly, and that's going to be the focus of the next lesson in this unit. These are the key questions that we should consider when we're trying to define the nature of the problem, and we'll go through each of these in turn. So first, what is the problem? Uh, this should be very clear and very explicit. Um, if it's vague, uh, the rest of your analysis will be vague. Um, and so uh, just on the, the right here, right, the word climate change, while it's a good starting point, uh, it's not clear enough. Uh, this is nowhere near specific enough for policy analysis um, because climate change carries so many 
uh, elements. Also remember that, that we want to define our terms from the very beginning because some words could have multiple meaning and we want to be very careful and very clear so that we know that our audience is on the same page as us. Uh, and this is just like forming a research question uh, in any kind of uh, scientific methodology. It should be very specific. It should be bounded uh, geographically. Uh, and it should be something that can be measured and can be uh, acted upon. So uh, this is a much clearer, much more specific problem definition that I'm going to use through the rest of this, uh, this unit. Uh, so Wilmington, Delaware's low-lying neighborhoods are extremely susceptible to climate change-induced flooding. That sounds like a mouthful, but it is very specific. Next, we want to identify the impacts of the problem. Uh, what are the symptoms, right? What are the things that we can observe uh, that, that are felt because this problem exists? Uh, how does it manifest? Uh, what are we seeing? Um, and we're going to need evidence for this. So remember, we're going to need to be using in-text citations uh, of sources of evidence for this problem. So for this example, we are going to focus on Wilmington Southbridge neighborhood, which is just across the Christina River uh, from the, the riverfront uh, where we are now. So Southbridge is very low lying and as such is prone to flooding and heavy rain events. Um, and it never really dries out very well. Uh, and so some homes in the neighborhood uh, do have chronic water damage uh, and mold as a result. Um, and uh, as sea levels rise, some parts of the neighborhood are projected to become uninhabitable. So this is a map of Southbridge and the projected impacts of sea level rise. Uh, so the light blue sections kind of right along the, the water, um, those are projected to, be, uh, to become flooded if sea levels rise just one foot. Um, if sea levels were to rise three feet, uh, we're seeing some serious threats to the neighborhood. We can see all of this, these green sections are projected to become chronically flooded uh, if sea levels rise just, just three feet. Um, and then at five feet, we're seeing additional sections, the yellow uh, be, becoming uninhabitable. So it is something we've been able to map and project uh, could very well be the case if sea levels continue to rise. Our next step is to examine who is impacted by the problem. Uh, inevitably, some of the problems that we're working with are going to impact some people, some groups uh, more than others. Um, and so we really want to identify who feels those impact. We'll look at this in terms of geography, race, class, gender, occupation, uh, and some problems will involve different species. For example, uh, the, the border wall uh, along the, the U.S.-Mexico border um, that was constructed during the Trump administration uh, has interrupted the kind of natural migration patterns of some animals uh, and we're seeing some of those animals are, are dwindling in numbers um, and may even go extinct as a result of this new uh, artificial uh, barrier. As I mentioned, some individuals are going to feel the impacts of, of some problems more than others, uh, and, and some problems will impact everyone. In any case, we need to be able to use evidence here. And so and so for our example, uh, going back to Southbridge, uh, Southbridge is one of Wilmington's most disadvantaged neighborhoods. Um, it is very racially segregated. It's 71% Black. Uh, and the median household income in 2010 was $22,000. Uh, 30% of households in that neighborhood fell below the poverty line. Uh, and this data can be found uh, on the city of Wilmington's website. Uh, you can also find uh, information about your geographies uh, using the website of the U.S. Census Bureau. Another issue you'll have to address as you do your problem definition is explaining to your audience why the problem is important. Uh, why should someone care? Uh, and we should never assume this is self-evident. Um, different People will care about different things. Uh, political persuasion will play a large part in this, uh, you know, and, and some people will even deny that some problems exist. So you really do have to make a case uh, for why your issue is important. Um, and you should know that your audience will care about different things. Uh, some people are very driven by human rights and, and, and you know, violations of those human rights. Uh, some people are very driven by educational equity. 
uh, some people are very driven by dollars. Um, and so knowing who you're talking to, what your, your target audience is, and what those folks care about is going to be really important uh, as you do your research um, and as you frame your, your policy issue. Uh, so in our case in Southbridge, uh, there are really significant uh, impacts to quality of life and health for residents of the area. Um, these are two individuals who are working really hard to bring these issues to light. Um, residents in the neighborhood, uh, I mentioned, you know, it is, it's a fairly impoverished neighborhood, so they have few options to leave. Um, you know, the, the availability of funds to go somewhere else um, are, are, are few. Uh, and so they're kind of stuck there, right? Not to mention, I mean, there are generations who've, who've grown and, and lived there, uh, and that, that place is home for them. And yet there's looming displacement. Uh, the sea level rise that I projected is, is more than likely. And uh, it's, it's the threat of, of being flooded out of your home is looming uh, in the background of, of every everyday life. As rain events, heavy rain events occur, um, the area does flood, uh, you know, usually up to a few inches of water, uh, if not more. Um, and when that happens, uh, pollution tends to get swept up in that flooding and uh, carry, uh, you know, chemicals uh, and, and waste products and, and trash all over the place, sometimes into people's homes. Um, and there are absolutely environmental justice implications um, if you care about environmental justice, right? Uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds are typically the first uh, most often to feel environmental uh, uh, impacts. Um, and then we want to look at those causes, right? And so we drew our map um, and we want to uh, we want to identify what's contributing to the problem. Uh, remember, cause, it's a loaded word, so we want to be very careful with it. Um, and we want to uh, note that a problem usually has several contributing factors. And so we're going back to these proximate and root causes just as a quick review. Um, proximate causes are the immediate causes, the things that can be directly observed causing our problem. Identifying proximate causes is easier um, and intervening at that point is going to be easier, but it will be superficial. Uh, root causes are the causes of the proximate causes. Remember, we traced back a few steps. Um, and uh, these are the things that often contribute to our proximate causes um, and therefore contribute to our, our observed problem. Uh, in our case, some of the proximate causes of, of flooding in Southbridge are sea level rise. Uh, it's a low-lying neighborhood. Um, the infrastructure in that neighborhood is outdated, so uh, stormwater control uh, is not what it should be. Um, as some background, a lot of cities uh, on the East Coast were built, uh, you know, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, 130 years ago. And um, the infrastructure to uh, control stormwater isn't what it is today. Um, and sewer systems in many of these cities are pretty much two parallel troughs uh, you know, under the street, one trough carrying uh, uh, sewage, right? And one trough carrying stormwater uh, with nothing enclosing them. And so in a flooding event, uh, the, the, wa the stormwater comes in, goes over the separation between the two. And now uh, we've got a slurry of, of stormwater and, and sewage uh, mixed up now flooding the streets. And then of course, poverty. This is a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of resources at its disposal. Um, and the individuals who live there don't have the resources to be able to build their way out of this problem. Uh, and then we can look at root causes, and some of the root causes of this issue include climate change, right? Climate change is leading to sea level rise, is leading to the flooding in Southbridge. Um, you know, carbon emissions, like I mentioned, pollution, um, and then some things may not be quite as obviously connected, but systematic racism or systemic racism um, is connected directly to, uh, to poverty um, and is con connected directly to uh, outdated infrastructure. And of course, we can uh, link this all to the failures of urban renewal from the 1950s and 60s. Um, Southbridge was was largely built as an urban renewal site. Um, it, it 
lots of the neighborhood was built as a housing project. Um, and it was built in a place that wasn't considered valuable because it's low lying and kind of marshy. And these places were basically used as sites to contain poverty away from city centers. So once we've looked at uh, the causes of our problem, we want to see what kind of current policies uh, impact this problem in one way or another. Um, you know, are there already policies in place that are trying to fix the problem, or are there other policies that are actually contributing to the problem itself? Um, you know, so for our example, the city has undertaken a project to clean out uh, sewer and stormwater pipes of debris that kind of backs up stormwater and, and leads to this flooding. Uh, there's a project underway to separate sewer and stormwater pipes, like I was telling you, instead of having two parallel troughs next to each other um, that can flood into each other, um, actually encasing those those into separate pipes so that if if there is overflow, it's not it, it's not uh, contaminating everything. Um, the city has actually built and recently opened a wetland park, um, which is a uh, kind of a giant retention pond um, to help kind of divert water when there is a flooding event. Um, all of these are policies that are actually helpful, uh, but there are other policies that are hurtful, right? The, the EPA is, is weak. Um, it, it doesn't have a lot of uh, teeth to really control uh, environmental policy, climate policy. Um, and so that's, that's something that actually hurts. So you're gonna do what I just did for your own issue. Um, so you're gonna go through and, and map it out, identify all of those causes and, and, and impacts of that problem. Uh, and you're gonna do a kind of a comprehensive problem definition like we did here. Uh, if you're interested in reading more about Southbridge and the flooding issues that have been going on there, uh, there's a link in the slides for that. And of course, if you have questions while you're doing this project, please reach out to me directly uh, through email.